Hi, this is Dana with GMAT Ninja, and today I will be talking about parallelism and meaning. And in particular, we will go over how to make the determination of where your stem of your sentence ends and where the parallel structure begins. So we'll start off by doing a brief recap of how to think about parallelism in general, um, and then we'll dive right into some trickier official examples that really make you think through the meaning of the sentence to determine whether the parallelism makes any sense. As a uh, quick disclaimer, there are very few rules that you follow 100% of the time on GMAT sentence correction, so you never want to turn your brain off. You're always thinking about logic and meaning in your sentence. Um, these you know, guidelines will really help you to make the most efficient eliminations on a lot of different sentence correction options. Um, however, there is almost always going to be some exception to the rule, so you never want to stop thinking about meaning. Diving into parallelism. Um, if you need a little bit more on parallelism, you can go back to the previous videos that go more in depth over the mechanics of how parallelism works. Um, but just as a brief recap, uh, let's start with this sentence. We have the customer service representative was friendly, polite, and explained everything thoroughly. As always with parallelism, what you want to do first is notice your marker word. Here we've got the word and that tells me my sentence is being split up into a parallel list. After you notice the word, uh, the marker word, you go immediately after and determine what part of speech you're dealing with here. Uh, the word explained in this sentence is a verb. Then I'm looking earlier in the sentence to see what else is the author trying to list in parallel with this thing uh, that they've got at the end here, this verb. Looking at this sentence, it's pretty clear that what we are listing here are the words polite, and friendly, right? In particular, having this word polite kind of on its own in the middle there tells me that it's one element of the list. And, you know, the other thing that is quite similar here is the word friendly. Um, next thing I'm doing is thinking about what parts of speech those are and does it match what I've got after my parallelism marker? Uh, friendly and polite are both adjectives, so we've definitely got a problem with the parallelism in this sentence. Final thing to think about when you've got parallelism is to determine does it actually make sense for your stem to lead into each of your parallel bits of your sentence. Um, if you do that with the first two legs here, totally makes sense, right? So our stem ends here, right, right before our uh, sentence splits off into this list. And we've got the customer service representative was. And then we start listing stuff. Was friendly, makes sense. Was polite, makes sense was explained everything thoroughly, suddenly no good. So what we have here is this verb gets repeated. We've got another verb here. Um, so you really can't put this third thing in parallel after this particular stem. So pretty clearly, this does not work grammatically. Sometimes on the GMAT, you have something that grammatically does work, right? That could be put in parallel uh, with one another. But then when you think about meaning, and in particular, you try to do exactly that thing where you put everything with your stem, it just doesn't make any sense. So those are the things that we're gonna focus on in today's video. And to kick off, we will start right away with an official example. Um, this is a pared down uh, example with only two options. So just go ahead, take a look through those two and really think through this process of first the, the marker word, what comes after, what could be parallel earlier in your sentence, and does it make any sense? I'll go ahead and throw that example up here on the board, and then we will discuss it afterward. All right, let's go ahead and go through this example. 
Uh, so as always, I will start out by reading A as a whole. Um, we have faced with an estimated $2 billion budget gap, the city's mayor proposed a nearly 17% reduction in the amount allocated the previous year to maintain the city's major, major cultural institutions and to subsidize hundreds of local arts groups. Kind of a mouthful, kind of a lot going on here. Um, but as always, what we're looking for are those marker words that are going to help us pick out the most important thing to look at first. And this is a parallelism video. So as you can guess, we have the parallelism marker here, uh, the word and. So you notice this word immediately after this word, we have to subsidize, to being a preposition and subsidize being kind of the basic form of a verb. Looking earlier in the sentence, do we have anything that could be parallel with to subsidize? We have uh, that the mayor is doing this stuff ah, to maintain. So again, we have this preposition and then this kind of basic form of the verb to maintain. So grammatically, we do have an option here that, that works where we've got to maintain parallel with to subsidize. Now let's look at the meaning of the sentence. Does it actually make sense for our stem to end here and then our parallel structure to begin with to maintain? Um, let's look before and, and, and see what's going on with this stem. So in this first part of the sentence, what we have is an opening modifier. So someone is faced with this estimated $2 billion budget gap. And then after we learn who that is, the city's mayor, right? So we've got this, this uh, budget gap that the mayor is dealing with. So what is the mayor going to do about this? Well, the city's mayor proposed a nearly 17% reduction in the amount allocated the previous year. So now we've got the mayor reducing stuff. And then our sentence splits off into its parallel bits. So these reductions come in two forms. It is uh, that we are uh, reducing the amount allocated to maintain the city's cultural institutions. And then we're also reducing the amount allocated to subsidize hundreds of local arts groups. Sad for these institutions and these arts groups, but it makes sense, right? We've got this budget gap and then the, uh, the city's mayor is going to reduce the budget in these two ways. So grammatically, we've got something that works. Meaning-wise, seems to make sense. So let's Keep A for now and take a look at B. Reading B as a whole, we have faced with an estimated $2 billion budget gap. The city's mayor proposed to reduce by nearly 17% the amount from the previous year that was allocated for the maintenance of the city's major cultural institutions and to subsidize hundreds of local arts groups. So again, we've got this marker word and, and we've got the same stuff following this preposition to and this verb subsidize. So is there something that could be parallel to this earlier in the sentence? If you look roughly in the same realm uh, that we saw earlier, uh, we've got for the maintenance instead of this to maintain. So for is still a preposition, um, but this, the maintenance is a noun. Don't love it. Uh, grammatically doesn't really seem to be parallel. Let's see if there's anything better, any other options that are more parallel grammatically. If you look earlier, we have this to reduce. So to reduce, to subsidize, grammatically totally makes sense for those things to be parallel to one another. But let's take a look at the meaning and see, does it actually work to end our stem here and then to list these two things in parallel? So again, we've got this city mayor who is faced with this budget gap and then as written in B, the city mayor is proposing two things. First, he or she is pro uh, proposing to reduce by nearly 17% the amount from the previous year that was allocated for the maintenance of the city's major, cul culture, major cultural institutions. Man, that's a mouthful. Um, so that makes sense. Uh, that, that works so far. It, it's kind of in line with what we've seen earlier. But then if you do that same thing with the second leg, you run into issues. We have that uh, the city's mayor proposed to subsidize hundreds of local arts groups. So the mayor is trying to get rid of this budget gap, right? It makes so much more sense for the mayor to be reducing the budget in these two ways, right? Whereas in B, what we have is the, the mayor is reducing it in one way, and then they're actually proposing to subsidize these local arts groups. In other words, to pay more for these local arts groups. So even though in B we do have something that is grammatically parallel, we don't have anything that actually makes sense to list in parallel that is also grammatical at the same time. So A is a much better option than B, and you can go ahead and get rid of B. 
Uh, let's go ahead and do another example. As always, I will throw it up on the screen for a couple of minutes, uh, take your time, answer it, and then we will discuss on the other side. All right, let's go ahead and talk it through. In A, we have scientists have reportedly discovered what could be the largest and oldest living organism on Earth, a giant fungus that is an interwoven filigree of mushrooms and root-like tentacles spawned by a single fertilized spore some 10,000 years ago and extending for more than 30 acres in the soil of a Michigan forest. Again, and that's a lot. However, it becomes much easier if you know what to focus on. Here I am seeing the marker word and, which tells me that we've got parallelism happening. And then immediately after we have this word extending in A. So what part of speech is extending? Here it is a modifier. It's just describing something that is extending for more than 30 acres in the soil of a Michigan forest. So now I'm looking earlier in the sentence to see whether there's something that could be parallel to this modifier extending. Looking a little bit earlier, we have this word spawned, which is interesting. Now, spawned doesn't look like the word extending, right? We don't have an ing modifier happening here. But if you think about function, well, this is just describing something, right? It's in fact describing this filigree of mushrooms and root-like tentacles. What do we know about them? Well, that they were spawned by a single fertilized spore some 10,000 years ago. That makes sense. And this is just there to describe or modify this filigree of mushrooms and tentacles. So does it make sense when I think about that stem and then the sentence splitting into these two parallel bits? Well, that means that we've got uh, this filigree of mushrooms and root-like tentacles uh, described as this spawned thing, which again, yeah, makes sense. And then with our second parallel leg, we have the filigree of mushroom and root-like tentacles extending for more than 30 acres in the soil of the Michigan forest. Yeah, you can totally imagine that filigree, right, in those tentacles extending through the forest. So A is looking pretty good. We've got something grammatically that could be parallel, and it makes sense for the sentence to split up in that particular spot. So A is looking good. Let's keep it. B. The only word that changes is this word uh, immediately following the and, and extends is a verb. Now, this is a long sentence, there's a lot going on. Is there a verb that could be parallel to this verb extends? Looking earlier, I am seeing this word is. Um, so we're talking about this fungus, right? This giant fungus that is an interwoven filigree, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, my word extends could be parallel to this verb is. Now that would move our stem, 
right? Instead of talking about this filigree of mushrooms and tentacles and then talking about, you know, describing it in these two ways as we have in A, now we are talking about this giant fungus and then we're describing it in two ways, right? So it is an interwoven filigree, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it extends for more than 30 acres in the soil of a Michigan forest. So which one makes more sense? for this filigree, right, in these root like tentacles to be spreading through the forest or for this fungus itself to be spreading through the forest. I think it's pretty clear that actually it makes much more sense for the tentacles, right, in that filigree to be the thing that we're describing as extending through the forest. Um, additionally, you could make the argument that it's pretty far to reach. It's just very unclear what this is supposed to be referring to, like where it's actually going back to. You could make it a lot more clear if you repeated the word that, if you really wanted your stem to be there. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to go that route. I think it's enough to say, hey, it makes way more sense for this, uh, this filigree and these tentacles to be described instead of this fungus itself. A is better than B meaning-wise, so we can get rid of B. C, uh, we have extended, uh, which again here is functioning as a verb, and we run into the same issue now with some added tense stuff that doesn't really make any sense. But at the end of the day, what we have is an issue again with the stem not really working as well as uh, the option that we already have in the bag, so we can get rid of C. D, now following our and, we have a pronoun, it, and then a verb extended. Um, if anything, this is even worse. It's a little bit tough to tell where your sentence would be splitting up. Now you could be splitting it up here, talking this it referring to this interwoven filigree. It could be talking about this giant fungus. Um, if we're talking about the filigree, then why would we not just do it as we've done in A, which is much more clear. Um, so D I think is on shaky ground, both grammatically and meaning wise, and we can go ahead and get rid of D. And then finally, in E, we have is extending, another verb. Um, and we run into the exact same issue as we ran into with, uh, with the other verbs here. So we can go ahead and get rid of E. A is the one that makes the most sense. So even though you've got several options that grammatically work, uh, doesn't really uh, work as well as the option that we have in A. So you would choose A. Let's do one final example. And I'll throw that up on the screen now. Take your time, and we will discuss it after. All right, let's go ahead and go through it. Uh, reading A as a whole, we have Thelonious Monk, who was a jazz pianist and composer, 
produced a body of work both rooted in the stride piano tradition of Willie the Lion Smith and Duke Ellington, yet in many ways he stood apart from the mainstream jazz repertory. Woo, long sentence again. <laughs> um, but what I'm noticing right off the bat here is we have this really nice pair, both in and. This is something that you should absolutely celebrate when you see on the GMAT because it is kind of the more mechanical version of parallelism. You don't actually have to decide where your stem ends and your parallel bits begin. The sentence is telling you very clearly that it has to be in this one particular location. Um, so we know that our stem ends right before this both and, uh, and that the things after your both and your and must be parallel to one another grammatically and logically. Uh, so right after the word both, we have the word rooted, which here is a modifier. Uh, we're just talking about this body of work. What do we know about it? It was rooted in this particular tradition. Following the word and, we have a noun, right? Just this name, Duke Ellington. Uh, not looking great. And if you think about the meaning, it also just clearly doesn't make any sense. If you try to put this second leg right after your stem, it really doesn't work. We just have produced a body of work, Duke Ellington. We really need some of this information to be outside of your parallel structure so that we know that we're talking about the tradition of, of these two people. So grammatically and meaning wise, A is just out and you can get rid of A. Let's take a look at B. Same thing, what's popping off the page is the both and then the and here. Um, We've flip-flopped a little bit in our route, but immediately following both here, we have uh, both in the stride piano tradition. So we have this uh, prepositional phrase. That's trying to be parallel to this noun, doesn't really work. And again, we've got a meaning issue where if you try to put this second parallel bit right after your stem, now we have produced a body of work that was rooted Duke Ellington. We really need that preposition to be outside of your parallel structure. Uh, so B is out, doesn't work. Then we get to C. If you look at C, the both has disappeared. And where a lot of my students make a mistake here is they kind of get married to the idea that your stem has to be somewhere in the realm that you've seen it in the first two answer choices. Um, but you don't have to have it exactly there. Um, we are totally free to just look at this and, look after the and and see, yep, we've still got that noun. Um, is there a noun that could be parallel to this noun that would make this parallel structure work? So Duke Ellington could be parallel to this uh, name right here, Willie the Lion Smith. Uh, that makes your parallel structure totally work, right? So our stem then moves to be right here. So we've got uh, this body of work rooted in the stride piano tradition of, and then we enter our list of Willie the Lion Smith and Duke Ellington. That really works. So without the both in the way, you get to choose where that stem makes sense. And sure enough, we do have an option that completely works for the parallelism in C. Now, there might be other issues with C. We'll come back to it at the end. But just to start with making as many eliminations as possible uh, based on parallelism, let's continue. In D, again, we don't have the word both. We're free to choose what's parallel to what. And we'll just choose that same exact thing, right? Where Duke Ellington is parallel to Willie the Lion Smith. So for right now, let's keep D in uh, and see if we can make an elimination on E. Here we have uh, the word both pops up again. And we've got the same issue that we had in B where immediately following both, we've got in the stride piano tradition, prepositional phrase, attempting to be parallel to this noun after your and, not gonna work, so E is out. Just based on parallelism alone, we're able to make three really, really nice mechanical eliminations. Uh, let's take a look and just close it out, see what the differences are between C and D uh, to get to your final answer. Um, reading C as a whole, uh, or actually first starting with the differences between C and D. First difference that's popping off the page to me is that in C, we've got this who produced, um, whereas in D is just produced. So this word produce is kind of tucked away in C into this modifier, right? The reason for saying uh, that blah, 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 who produced is just to add some modifying information about Thelonious Monk. Um, whereas in D, what we have is this nice uh, just subject verb combination for our sentence. 
So immediately when I see a difference like that, my first thought is, well, do I even have a main verb in C? So let's read C as a whole and see whether it's even a sentence at all. Um, we have jazz pianist and composer Thelonious Monk, who produced a body of work rooted in the stride piano tradition of Willie the Lion Smith and Duke Ellington, yet in many ways he stood apart from the mainstream jazz repertory. Um, so we've got this separate clause here, starting with the word yet, but we really need a whole you know, subject verb pair to come before that in order for this to be a full sentence. And we just don't have that in C. We've got a subject and then we've just got a whole bunch of modifying information. So C is actually not even a sentence and we can get rid of it. Um, D on the other hand corrects that, that issue and we do have a full sentence and the parallelism works. So D is our winner. So that's a little bit about meaning in parallelism and how to determine where your stem ends and where your parallel bits begin. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, thanks so much for watching and see you on the next one. Bye.